Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to at-home worship with New Dublin Presbyterian Church. And Lord willing, it will be the last at-home worship, or at least the last long stretch of at-home worship, uh, at least for a long time, as we move into outdoor worship once again next week, Palm Sunday, and continuing on with that through Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, 6 p.m., Good Friday, 6 p.m., and then an Easter morning sunrise at 645, and then, you know, the main Easter service at the normal Sunday time of 11 in the morning. Hope you can join us for some or for all of those things. You are more than welcome. Bring a mask, bring a lawn chair if you have one, or a blanket. If you don't have anything at all, there are benches here. Uh, We'll we'll find you something to sit on. Uh, Bring if, if you can, and we will look forward to observing and celebrating the last uh, few days of Jesus's earthly ministry and his death and his resurrection this coming week. Excuse me, well, starting on Palm Sunday and then through to Easter. If you have little kids around you for Easter, you are more than welcome to bring them to the Easter egg hunt, which is uh, Holy Saturday, which is the 3rd of April. Here, outside, outdoors, there will be uh, animals to pet, there will be uh, eggs to hunt, there will be snacks to eat, pre-packaged snacks, there will be an Easter story read. Bring them, let us know if you can, either through the event on our Facebook page, by calling me or the church, or by letting Linda Ely know. Uh, But if the day arrives, you have kids you didn't expect and you haven't let us know, bring them anyway. It'll be good. I believe, oh, and thank you to the 22 volunteers that came yesterday to clean up the churchyard. It looks beautiful, and uh, we are prepared again for outdoor worship. Thank you all very much. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, as it has these last several months, really. Uh, And we are very near now uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is what, of course, we will be doing next week when we gather in person outdoors, Lord willing. Hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud honor your father and your mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now and In this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. 
The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. So we have this morning what a lot of us, you know, have titled in our heads as the rich young ruler. He is called that in other gospels, especially in this one. All we know is that he was a man and that he's wealthy. But certainly a good, eager, earnest young man who seems in some ways to get it more than anyone else gets it in the gospel so far. Nobody else has said What must I do to gain eternal life? Unprompted, without Jesus leading them every step of the way by the hand. And you would think, wouldn't you, that Jesus would be over the moon about it. How many times, how many times in the gospel have we heard Jesus being frustrated again and again because people are just not getting it, because they're just stuck in old ways of thinking they're not open to the possibilities of God. I remember a couple weeks ago we got, you know, how long must I bear with you? So you'd think that Jesus would be delighted and instead he reacts in this very kind of lukewarm, uh, off-putting way. First he says, why are you even calling me good? Why are you calling me good? No one's good but God not the most welcoming of starts. And then he says, besides, you already know what to do. You know the answer to this question. And he goes through kind of a a summary of the Ten Commandments with the addition of a command not to defraud the poor, which is something as a rich man, uh, the, the young man would have opportunity to do. You know, if you're hiring other people, you have the opportunity to defraud them. So Jesus adds in this command to care for the poor, not to defraud the poor. It's almost dismissive. Why are you asking the question that way? And besides, you already know the answer to this question. He seems to have no time for this man at all. And he's not deterred. Despite this very lukewarm response from Jesus, he's still almost puppy-like. In the, you know, he's run up, he's fallen on his knees, and he's still, you know, I've done that from my youth. Just like a puppy. And you can almost hear in his head, you know, I've mastered those basics, give me something else to do. Give me Uh, You know, I've I've graduated elementary school. Time for middle school. Give me something else. And Jesus, it says, looks on him and loves him. He seems to now have Jesus' full attention. God looks, Jesus looks at him, Jesus loves him. And does give him something else to do. I wonder if the young man might not have preferred to stay with the brusque and the dismissive because he gives him to do the one thing that the young man can't do. Sell everything you have. Give the proceeds to the poor and come follow me. And we're told that the man goes away sad because he had great wealth. The one thing that the young man could not do is what Jesus asks him to do to come and become his disciple. And, in fact, to gain eternal life. And from the young man's reaction, we start to see the issue. The issue is presumably not with wealth itself. There are several disciples we know of in the Bible who are wealthy, who, in fact, uh, especially in the case of some women disciples, essentially fund the whole operation. So the the problem is not with wealth itself. Um, And and so the specifics of this command, sell everything and give it to the poor, is not for everyone. It is for some people. I'm not going to say the only person it ever was for in the history of the universe was this young man. There are others in history that we know of great Christians who have done the very thing and found great fellowship with Jesus through it, sold everything, 
they had and given it to the poor and committed themselves to a life of um, Christian ministry. And I'm not going to tell you that it's not for you. It might be. It's between you and Jesus. But it's not wealth as such that is the enemy here. The greatest enemies to faith are to faith, you know, which is trust in God, uh, resignation, trusting resignation to the will of God for your life is going to be, you know, the, the opposite of, so if you're, if you're self-satisfied, one, right, you're not going to think you need faith. And if you are proud, you're not going to have the ability to kind of give yourself up in the way that faith demands. So the great enemies of faith, self-satisfaction and pride, um, are often enabled by wealth, but wealth isn't the only thing that does this. You know, we can derive self-satisfaction and pride and the feeling that we are earning our, uh, all the good things that happen to us in life and a good future through, you know, our achievements at work, through how hard we work, uh, through how well we work, through how we raise our family, how much we've sacrificed to raise a good family. We can get it from the causes that we are involved with through having the right opinions and being willing to take to the streets for them. We're really good at finding ways to earn our way to worthiness, uh, to God's good pleasure, to eternal life, which, of course, is not just the adding of moment on moment forever, but permanent uh, joy and peace permanent life in fullness, fulfillment. We want to be able to earn them through having a high-paying job or being good and responsible and saving our money and being self-sacrificing and charitable and doing the right things and believing in the right opinions. So to us, if, if you take all of those things, whatever it is in your life that you want to find your pride and self-satisfaction in and substitute it for the word wealth, then we understand the astonishment of the disciples when they say, well then, who can be saved? Rich people, after all, have leisure to learn and study and give. If rich people can't earn their way into the kingdom of heaven, if they can't earn their way into eternal life, who can? Jesus says it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get in the kingdom of heaven because of the temptation right, that, that wealth brings to self-sufficiency and pride. You may have heard uh, a lot of us have. I've heard before, you know, this explanation that, oh, they don't mean like a literal, you know, camel and a little, you know, needle. Some of you do quilting, I know, or, or uh, needlework. They don't mean like that. They mean there's a little door in Jerusalem. This is an old story. It's at least um, 1,100 years old, but it, it doesn't seem to be any older than that. There's, all, there's no evidence that there was a little gate in Jerusalem that was hard for camels to get through, but not impossible. Jesus seems to be talking about an actual eye of an actual needle, actual camel, and he's exaggerating here for teaching effect. It's very hard, in other words, very hard for people who are constantly tempted with self-justifying um, prideful opportunities to get in to the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples are astonished. If they can't get in, who can? And the right question has come at last. The difference. They say, who then can? And Jesus seems to light up. He was so cold with this young man at first. And the disciples say, well, then who can? And Jesus says, with human beings, this is impossible. It is impossible to gain eternal life. But for God, all things are possible. 
the disciples have realized it's the first step. Only when we recognize that we can't get there ourselves, that we can't be good enough or charitable enough or self-sufficient enough to gain eternal life, to gain the kingdom of heaven, that's when the d door of divine possibility opens. Everything else is futile, and God begins to act. With humans, it's not possible. But with God, everything is possible. So whatever we've got our hope in that promises us life and joy and peace and salvation from our problems, that isn't Jesus. Even if it's a good and moral life like this young man had, those things are lying to us. They're lying about what they can do for us. Even a moral life is incomplete unless it leads to discipleship, discipleship rather, with Jesus. So Jesus' advice to this young man and to us was something like this. Get rid of whatever's holding you back from recognizing your own need. And in this young man's uh, position, it was wealth. Whatever is distracting you, whatever is tempting you to self-sufficiency and pride, whatever it is, get rid of it. It's lying to you. It cannot save you. Get rid of it and follow me. Follow Jesus, who is, of course, the way to eternal life. So it's not easy the call of discipleship, as I read in a very cleverly worded thing this week, the call of discipleship includes the cost of discipleship. Following Jesus isn't something that we can just add in to our life and our values. Another line to go in the checklist. But it, it's giving you a whole new checklist. You have to throw the old one away. It's a it subordinates and in some cases replaces the other things that we had going on before. Anything that resists that subordination, that giving up of self-reliance is a hazard to our eternal health and joy and peace. And it has to be gotten rid of, even if we have a lot of it, like the young man, even if we derived so much of our identity from it, like the old man, like the young man, rather. And in return, Jesus offers us himself as a substitute for the young man's wealth and for whatever else we've got going on. The things that can't keep their promises to make us happy and bring us joy and peace. But Jesus can keep those promises. And so when the disciples say, well, you're talking about cost. Look at, look at all we've given up, Peter says. You always rely on Peter uh, to say the thing that other people are going to be too embarrassed to say. Right? Everybody else, I'm sure, was thinking it. Well, look what all we've given up. Peter's the only one who says it uh, in character for Peter. So Peter says, look at all that we've given up. And Jesus acknowledges it. He says, yes, and whoever gives up even the most precious and valuable things in life, those things will be returned to them again. Jesus is able to satisfy our needs to keep the promise of eternal life and joy and peace. And he's the only thing that can. Everything else that keeps us from that is just a roadblock on the way. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish, listen, listen, is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Now is the time in worship when we go to our God with our concerns and our prayers with our love for the world and are met with his love for the world. Let us pray. 
Lord our God, we praise you that you care about our world, about our pain, about our joys and our concerns. We thank you that you have taught us to teach, taught us rather to tell them to you, that you have called us into your church and taught us about your love for us and for the world. And we pray for your church in all times and all places, in the places where it is hard to be the church and in the places that it is all too easy, that you would call us again and again to yourself, that you would cleanse us again and again from all our mistakes, all our impurities and our idolatries and errors, that we may truthfully and clearly and without unnecessary stumbling blocks proclaim your reign to your world. And we pray for all people and nations of the world, wherever they may be, that where there is war, you may bring a just and honorable peace. Where there is lack, that you would shower your plenty. That where there is injustice, you would bring your justice. And we pray for our own nation, for its sorrows and injustices. We mourn for those killed in Atlanta and pray for their friends and their families and ask that in the aftermath of this terrible tragedy that you would teach us how to prevent such things from happening again. We pray for our leaders, for our president and our governor, for our legislatures and our Congress, and all who make and enforce our laws that they would make and enforce those laws in justice and equality and fairness for the good of the people and not for selfish or partisan goals. And we pray for our own community, for those we love that you have laid in our hearts We ask that you heal the sick, that you soothe the suffering, that you accompany the dying, that you comfort the mourning, and the anxious, and the depressed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage, love, and serve the Lord. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you all, now and forever. Amen.